Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of those who will be watching this presentation on film, allow me to repeat for everyone a most sincere welcome into our home. Your interest in the John Birch Society, as evidenced by your presence here, is deeply appreciated. And because of this presumption of interest on your part, I've put together an in-depth presentation, which I suppose is merely a subtle way of preparing you for the fact that I'm going to be talking for quite a while. But the subject matter is large. And assuming you didn't come here merely to be entertained, there's no other way to provide the information you want. To narrow the field as much as possible, let me begin by explaining what ground I do not intend to cover. First of all, I will not talk about the spread of communism, foreign policy, riots, campus disorders, assaults against police, drug abuse, pornography, crime, or taxes. My topic is not the many problems that confront this nation. It is, hopefully, the solution to those problems. Secondly, it's not my goal to make conservatives, anti-communists, or activists out of anyone who doesn't already consider himself to be such. I have no illusions about my ability to deliver a single lecture which can reverse the attitudes of a lifetime. My realistic goal is not to sell the principles and program of the society but merely to identify them and to expound them. Next, it's not my purpose to pressure or embarrass anyone into joining the John Birch Society. That's not how it's done. Most of us became members only after considerable thought and study, and we expect that others will follow that same pattern. Now, naturally, we would be more than delighted if the non-members present did decide to join with us. That almost goes without saying. As a matter of fact, I would like all of you to consider this presentation as an open invitation to the John Birch Society. But your private response to that invitation must be entirely voluntary, and there will be no embarrassing pressure of any kind. And finally, I'm not going to try to answer the many charges that have been leveled against the John Birch Society. I realize that at one time or another, you've all heard that the society is fascist, secret, un-American, extremist, anti-Semitic, racist, even communist. But I learned a long time ago that it's a useless waste of time trying to answer these charges. First of all, the list is endless. They make up new ones faster than you can answer the old ones. And secondly, if I were to take that approach, you might learn a few of the things the John Birch Society is not, but you still wouldn't know what it is. So instead of approaching this subject from the negative point of view, I prefer the positive. If I can succeed in explaining what the John Birch Society is, then you'll understand quite well indeed what it is not. So let's turn now to the basic question. What is the John Birch Society? To answer that question, I've devised a definition which, although entirely accurate, will hardly satisfy you when you hear it. Nevertheless, here it is. The John Birch Society is a voluntary group of men and women who have joined together to promote more effectively the principles in which they believe in accordance with a plan of action designed to overcome the opposition against them. <laughs> now, what's that all about? It doesn't tell us very much because there are three questions yet to be answered. What are the principles in which they believe? What is the plan of action? And what is the opposition brought to bear against them? The answers to these three questions will tell us almost all there is to know about the John Birch Society. So let's take them in turn now, one by one. To explain the principles in which we believe, it'll be necessary to divide them into four categories, political, economic, social, and religious. Now, as far as our political principles are concerned, usually we're described as conservatives. But the debate, or the dialogue as it's now called, is not between conservatives and liberals. It goes back in history long before those words were ever invented. The opposing points of view properly are identified as individualism versus collectivism. And their champions are called individualists and collectivists. 
Now, the members of the John Birch Society consider themselves to be individualists. And here are the differences between the two as we see them. First of all, the individualist believes that the rights of the individual must not be obliterated by the desires of the collective or the group. The collectivist, on the other hand, believes that the group is more important than the single person within it, and that the individual must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. The individualist believes that with rights come responsibilities. And since we insist on individual rights, therefore we accept the principle of individual responsibility rather than group responsibility. We believe that every man has a personal and direct responsibility to provide first for himself, next for his family, and then for those outside his family who may be in need. The collectivist, on the other hand, declares that the individual is not personally responsible for charity, for raising his own children, providing for his aging parents, or even providing for himself, for that matter. This is a group function of the state, of government itself. As a matter of fact, this is always one sure way to spot who is an individualist and who is a collectivist. The individualist wants to be free to do it himself. The collectivist wants the government to do it for him. He's enamored by government. He idolizes government. He has a fixation on government as the ultimate group mechanism to solve all problems. Now, the reason is because government is the one group that can legally force everyone to participate. It has the power of taxation, backed by jails and force of arms, if necessary, to compel everyone to fall in line. And this leads to the third difference between the two groups. Simply stated, the individualist believes in freedom. The collectivist believes in compulsion. Now, let me give a few illustrations. As stated a moment ago, we believe that every man has a personal responsibility to provide for himself, if he can, and for his dependents. This means that routinely, we should all set aside a portion of our current earnings for the inevitability of unemployment through sickness, accident, or retirement. But as individualists, we also believe that we should be free not to do this if for whatever reason we prefer to act in some other manner. If we wish to live to the full extent of our income and plan to depend on our children or other relatives in our old age, or if we choose to take our chances on a greater income in later years, or even if we choose consciously to fall back on charity as a way of life, for whatever reason, we believe that a person should be free to choose his own course. We have no right to force him to comply with our ideas of what he should do. Now, by contrast, the collectivist says that since some people don't have the brains or the willpower or the desire to save on their own, let us pass a law and use the power of government to force them. There must not be freedom of choice in this matter. Otherwise, there will be many who do not do what we know they should do. This same contrast can be seen in the area of charity. We believe that Every man has a personal responsibility to be generous to those in need. But as individualists, we also believe that a man should be free not to be charitable if he doesn't want to. If he prefers to give to a different charity than the one we urge on him, if he prefers to give a smaller amount than what we think he should give, or if he prefers not to give at all, we don't believe we have any right to gang up on him and force him either directly by mob violence or indirectly by the ballot box. In either case, the principle is the same. It's called stealing. True charity is the voluntary giving of your own money. Government charity is the giving of someone else's money, which of course is why it's so popular. And so the individualist believes that every man must be free in this matter to act or not to act as he sees fit. The collectivist believes just the reverse. Because there are some who will not be charitable as we think they should be, let us pass a law and use government to force them. Let's not call it stealing, though. Let's call it welfare. And so it goes on almost every conceivable issue in which the end result generally is conceded to be desirable. As individualists, we believe in freedom of choice. The collectivist inevitably turns to the coercion of government force. Now, we hear a lot of talk today about 
right-wingers, left-wingers, extremists, and moderates. So let's turn now to the question of where the John Birch Society stands in the political spectrum. The political spectrum concept, if it has any meaning at all, is a measurement scale showing all the variations in government, ranging from zero at one end to 100% at the other. Now, the extremists at the zero end would be those who advocate no government at all, the anarchists. The extremists at the other end would be those who advocate total government. And who are they? Well, the communists, of course, but also the Nazis, the fascists, and any others, no matter what they may call themselves, if they advocate total government control over the people, they are all, by definition, totalitarians. Communism and Nazism are not opposites. Call it right or left, it makes no difference. They're both at the same totalitarian end of the political spectrum. But where does the John Birch Society fit into this picture? Aren't we supposed to be the extremists? That's what we hear constantly. Well, the truth of the matter is, we turn out to be the real middle of the rotors. Not that we think that's any particular virtue in itself, but we are just as opposed to the extreme of anarchy as we are to the extreme of totalitarianism. As members of the John Birch Society, we recognize that government is absolutely necessary for an orderly society. But following the dictum that government, like fire, is both beneficial and dangerous, we believe in the concept of limited government. And we believe that the constitutional republic created by our founding fathers is the best form of limited government that has yet been devised by man. Now, to understand why we feel this way, it'll be necessary to define the word republic and to point out the differences between a republic and a democracy. Now, democracy is a form of government based upon the principle of majority rule, period, end of discussion. Now, that's not very complicated. Majority rule, it's easy to understand, easy to sell to the masses, and I might add, deadly. For example, what would you call a lynch mob? That's majority rule. There's only one dissenting vote, and he's at the end of the rope. Now, that's pure democracy in action. Now, but wait a minute, you say. The majority should rule, yes, but not to the extent of destroying the rights of the minority. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are no longer describing a democracy. We are speaking of a republic. A republic is a limited democracy. It's a form of government based upon the principle of limited majority rule. Limited so that the minority, even a minority of one, can be protected against the whims and passions of the majority. And how do you protect the minority from the majority? You write down a set of rules on a piece of paper. You say, this we can do, that we cannot. At the top of the paper, you write the word constitution. And then everyone agrees to follow the rules no matter what the temptation. And when you're finished, you've created a constitutional republic. Notice that the entire function of our Bill of Rights is to spell out in detail the many ways in which the majority, acting through government, must not be allowed to infringe on the rights of the minority. The First Amendment sets the pace with the words, Congress shall pass no law. And then the document proceeds to explain that Congress, even though it expresses the will of the majority, shall not deny the minority the right of free exercise of religion, freedom of speech, peaceful assembly, the right to bear arms, and others. Congress shall not. The majority shall not. This is the meaning of a republic. And it didn't just happen that way accidentally. Our founding fathers knew exactly what they were doing. Remember that interesting exchange of letters between Thomas Jefferson and a friend who had criticized him for being distrustful of men with political power? Using the same argument we so often hear today, the friend asked, have you no faith in the men we elect? Have you no confidence in our government? And remember that beautiful reply. Jefferson said, confidence is everywhere the parents of despotism. In questions of power, let no more be heard of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. 
And there, in a single phrase, is the best summary you'll ever find of a republic. Binding men down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. And this is the concept of limited government in which the members of the John Birch Society believe. Well, all right, so much for our political principles. Now let's turn to the economic principles in which we believe. To accurately describe ourselves in this category, it would be proper to say that we are, <laughs> are you ready? We are laissez-faire capitalists. <laughs> now, I never knew what a laissez-faire capitalist was until I went to college. And then I learned that it was a big, fat man with an expensive cigar, a diamond stick pin in his cravat, spats on his shoes, sitting on a huge bag of money, squeezed out of the exploited toil of frail women and starving children. Seriously, if anyone had told me then that he was a capitalist, much less a laissez-faire capitalist, I would have thought that he was the, the meanest, greediest man in the whole world. It wasn't until many years later that I found out what those words actually meant. And lo and behold, I was shocked to discover that I was a laissez-faire capitalist. Now, laissez-faire capitalism merely means the private ownership of property. In other words, owned by the people instead of the politicians, with a minimum of government interference in the marketplace. Laissez-faire means simply, let the people do it. Now, let's get one thing straight right here. There are very few rich people in the John Birch Society. I wish we had more, but we don't. Most of us come from the lower and middle economic levels of the nation. In other words, we're part of that broad middle class that still works for a living and pays the taxes. Frankly, we would like to become rich if we could, and I think most of you would too. Even our socialist friends would like to be rich socialists. They don't object to wealth. It's just the other guy's wealth that bothers them. The desire to become rich, of course, is by no means our only motivation for promoting free enterprise, nor even our primary motivation. We're quite aware that in spite of our best efforts, most of us will never accumulate vast wealth. But it's our firm conviction that laissez-faire capitalism not only makes it possible for some to enjoy the true luxury of riches, but more important than that, it enables all the rest of us to raise our standard of living far in excess of what is possible under any other concept. And this is the key. No one wants to see people go hungry or live in poverty. And the one thing that collectivists and individualists hold in common is their desire to produce a system that will raise the level of the poor. Their differences lie, as always, in how to achieve this goal. The collectivist is not very complicated in his approach. He looks around him, sees some very rich people living high in the hog. He sees poor people with barely enough to get by. He remembers his old Robin Hood movies, and Eureka, he's got the solution. Take it from the rich and give it to the poor. What could be simpler than that? It's a perfect solution, except for one minor detail. It doesn't work. Now, one reason why it doesn't work, and never has worked, and never can work, is that the rich just don't have enough to go all the way around. Now, for instance, on the international scene, we know that the United States, by comparison to the rest of the world, is a very rich uncle. Yet, if we had some magic device for converting everything of value in this country into cash, and then dividing it equally among all the people of the world, if we could tear down every building, brick by brick, cash them in, including the value of the labor, if we could cash in all the machines, roads, automobiles, TV sets, everything except the clothes on our backs, do you have any idea to what extent we would raise the standard of living of the people of the world? they would be allowed to eat and dress and live like we do in this country for about one week. And then it would all be gone. If all the millionaires in America were taxed 100% of their incomes each year, not a single penny left for themselves, it would run the federal government for less than 39 hours. In fact, if all the income were taken from those making only $25,000 a year or more. If they were allowed to keep nothing for themselves, it would still run the government for less than 72 hours. Now, when you consider these facts,
several things become rather obvious. First, it's the little guy who's paying most of the taxes. And secondly, it always will be the little guy who pays most of the taxes because even if we take it all away from the rich man, there just isn't enough to do the job. Now the point is simply this. You can't help the poor by pulling down the rich. Now it may make you feel better to do so. You may envy the wealth of others. You may resent the attitude and behavior of those with wealth. You may feel that they don't deserve it. You may be a politician who knows you can always get votes by promising to soap the rich. But if your concern really is only for the poor, then you're wasting your time. You can't help the poor by pulling down the rich. Well, how then do you help the poor? Well, first of all, the individualist recognizes that there is no utopia. There always will be those who, for a variety of reasons, will be unable to produce. Infants, the sick, the lame, the mentally retarded. And we also recognize that the only way for these unproductive individuals to live at all is off the surplus of those who do produce. Now that's basic. The problem before us then is how to expand the surplus. Unless we can do that, the poor shall stay poor, no matter how much we wish to help them. Now following this in sequence then, how do we expand the surplus? How do we achieve a situation in which each productive human being becomes increasingly more productive? Now, the answer, of course, is that the productive individual must be given some incentive for making an increased effort, for working harder or longer, or for investing in tools. Few people choose to work unless they're motivated by some incentive outside of the work itself. Now, there are four kinds of human incentive. Fear, the motivation of the slave. Hate, the motivation of the victim. Altruism, the motivation of the philosopher. And fourthly, desire for reward, the motivation of everyone. Now, of the four, the desire for material reward is by far the most powerful and sustaining incentive for most people. It follows, therefore, and please note this carefully, that the degree to which government taxes away the material rewards from those who produce in order to give to those who do not produce, that is the degree to which government destroys the incentive to continue producing, and hence, is the degree to which it reduces the surplus and hurts those who must live off that surplus, the very people supposedly it's trying to help. Now, we all know of cases where the progressive income tax, for instance, has discouraged some wealthy businessmen from expanding their businesses. The man says to himself, why should I take on a new business venture? It would only mean more work and more headaches, and why should I risk my capital? I could lose everything. On the other hand, if I did everything right, made no mistakes at all, why, the government would only take most of my profits anyway, so why do it? And he doesn't do it. Which means there's one more business never begun, one more factory never built, thousands of jobs never created, millions of dollars never added to the surplus. And who is hurt by this process? The rich man? Of course not. True, he may not become quite as wealthy as he would otherwise, but he continues to live very well indeed. In the final analysis, government manipulation of the marketplace always hurts the poor far more than the rich. And this is a fact of life the collectivist never seems to understand. The collectivist approach always is to divide up the existing economic pie into equal shares to make sure that no one gets any larger or smaller piece than anyone else. Of course, you may have noticed that those in charge of dividing up the pie usually wind up with a larger piece for their equal share. And this, by the way, is one of the great contradictions between Marxist theory and practice. In theory, communism is a classless society. Everyone supposedly belongs to the same class with no economic differences or privileges. Yet in practice, in every country where communism has come to power, the commissars and cadre of the Communist Party live like kings, while the workers and peasants continue to struggle for the bare necessities of life. 
Now, the individualist recognizes the fact that under any system, someone is going to have more pie than others. The only question is, who is it going to be? Should it be the politicians and bureaucrats who divide the pie? Or should it be the people who have worked to make the pie? Now, if the dividers of pie get the larger piece, then the producers slow down and there's less pie for everyone. But if the producers are allowed to keep what they produce and dispense the surplus as they see fit, then they'll work harder and longer, they'll invent, they'll invest, and they'll produce more pie than you've ever dreamed was possible. And there'll be more for everyone. And then those who have even the smallest pieces out of the larger pie will end up with more pie than those who are stuck with equal pieces, so-called, out of the smaller pie. Now, that's a lot of pie for an analogy, but <laughs> it's an accurate summary of the humanitarian function of the free enterprise system. And the reason why in less than 150 years, this nation sprang up from a hostile wilderness and became the envy of the collectivist old world. Over 120 years ago, a French economist by the name of Frederick Bastiat wrote an essay entitled, The Law. It contains one of the clearest and most compelling statements of political philosophy that you'll ever find. In straightforward language and logic, Bastiat proves beyond all doubt that the proper function of government is to protect the lives, liberty, and property of its citizens, but not to provide for them. To protect and not to provide. For in order to provide for some, first it must take from others. And once it has been granted the power to take from some and give to others, then it becomes the potential mechanism for what Bastet called legalized plunder. The control of that mechanism becomes a highly coveted tool by individuals and groups who wish to line their own pockets out of the taxes taken from someone else. Everybody wants in on the take. Businessmen clamor for tariffs and price-fixing laws so they can charge higher prices. And when the consumers discover that what's going on, instead of calling for the elimination of all such government favoritism, they merely start demanding that they get theirs, too. Labor unions clamor for minimum wage laws. Farmers nuzzle up to the trough and demand price supports. The unemployed want benefits. Families want apartments. Students want grants. Colleges want subsidies. The entire process spirals around and around until finally everybody is plundering everybody. And in the end, when taxes skyrocket to the point where there's nothing left to plunder, then the whole system collapses and the game is over. All that's left is the plundering mechanism itself, total government. And freedom is lost. This process, described by Bastiat over 120 years ago, is exactly what's happening in America today. And his warning about the end result of that process constitutes still a third reason why we champion the free enterprise concept. Even if collectivism were not morally wrong, even if it did produce a higher standard of living, we would still oppose it because freedom is more important than prosperity. To resist a tyranny, you must be independent of that tyranny for your subsistence. If the government provides your food, your clothing, your shelter, your education, your job, your medical care, your retirement, then the government controls you most effectively indeed. If that government should ever become tyrannical, and they have a way of doing that in history, then you've had it, my friends. We believe that one of the greatest lessons of history that so desperately needs to be relearned by the American people, our forefathers knew it well, is this. Any time a government is powerful enough to give the people everything they want, it is also powerful enough to take from the people everything they've got. You cannot have one without the other. Well, let's turn now to the social principles in which we believe. Because we are individualists and accept the concept of personal responsibility for ourselves and our dependents, therefore, we view the family as the basic unit of society, secondary only to the individual himself. 
All totalitarian regimes, whether of ancient Sparta or modern Peking, all of them strive to destroy the close-knit family in order to remove any loyalties that might be higher than to the state itself. They don't like competition. Totalitarians would prefer no family units at all if they could force that on the people. The communes of Red China or Hate Ashbury are ideal for their purposes. But almost the same results can be achieved even within the institution of matrimony if only the people involved can be induced to abandon their parental responsibilities because the real objective is to remove the family as a possible alternate source of guidance and support. And so the John Birch Society is committed to the preservation and strengthening of the family for practical as well as moral reasons. Now we believe that all men are equal in the eyes of their creator and that all men should be treated equally by the law. But we also believe in freedom of association, that man should be free to select those with whom he chooses to work, to play, or to live. We believe that this is essential to any truly free society and besides it's entirely natural. In general, people prefer to associate with those who share something in common with them. They prefer to be with those who are approximately the same age, the same educational level, the same interests and hobbies, the same economic strata, the same religion, the same race, the same tastes and entertainment, the same political views. And everyone does this to one degree or another. You do it. I do it. Now, there's a name for this process. It's called discrimination. In order to select those with whom you wish to associate, you must, by definition, be discriminate. You must be free to reject those with whom you do not wish to associate. Otherwise, you can't choose. Well, now, the problem, of course, arises in the fact that today, because of increasing racial tensions, the word discrimination has become confused with the word hatred. But they're not at all the same. Just because you prefer to be with those of your own age group doesn't mean that you have to hate those who are older or younger than you. And this is equally true in the case of race or religion or any other category. Furthermore, we believe that government has absolutely no business attempting to dictate the social relationships between individuals and groups. We find no constitutional basis for this, no moral basis, and certainly no logical basis. For every time government steps in and uses the force of law to rearrange social relationships in accordance with some omnipotent formula, it always makes matters worse. It's like trying to stop a dog from barking by throwing stones at him. Now, please understand, this means we are just as opposed to a state government forcing segregation as we are opposed to the federal government forcing integration. Both are wrong. Government should stay out of this matter entirely and leave it up to the individuals involved. At any rate, inside the John Birch Society, we practice what we preach. Membership is open to all races, all religions, all classes. They're all there and they're all welcome. In some places, we have entirely Negro chapters. In others, both Negro and white together. But I can assure you, in every case, the arrangement is because the individuals directly involved want it that way. We make no effort to force a prescribed formula on anyone. And frankly, we think that the world would be a lot better place to live if others would follow these same social principles. Well, let's turn now to the religious principles which members of the John Birch Society hold in common. We believe that integrity in government, honesty in the marketplace, and social harmony, all of these must be based on morality. They can't be legislated into existence. No matter how many laws you write down on the books, if these conditions don't exist in the hearts of our citizens, then they'll never exist in our public life. Furthermore, we believe that true morality is impossible without a firm religious base. And when I say true morality, I mean doing what is right just because it's right and for no other reason. Doing what is right even though it may be to our disadvantage, even though it may cost us our very lives to do so. But unless our concept of what is right 
stems from religious convictions, unless it comes from a divine source outside of and bigger than ourselves, who would be willing to make such a sacrifice? We hear a lot of talk today about the new morality, sometimes called humanism or situation ethics. The concept is that there's no such thing as right or wrong outside of the individual himself. What's right for one may be wrong for another. What's right today may be wrong for the same person tomorrow. It all depends on his attitude at the time. What makes us happy or gives us pleasure supposedly is right. If it gives us pain, it's wrong. And we must decide on that basis only. In other words, do whatever we want to do and call it morality. Of course, that's nonsense. The so-called new morality is merely the old hedonism with a respectable name. And while we certainly grant that anyone has a right to be a hedonist if he chooses, still, we strongly reject hedonism as the controlling philosophy of public life. Now, George Washington summarized this concept rather well, I think, when he said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. This, of course, is the reason why our nation was founded on the religious principle of deism, a firm belief in God as a creator. The very first sentence in the Declaration of Independence refers to God as the authority for that action. But the key to why this is important is found further along in the words, all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. You see, if our rights are not endowed by our creator, what then is their origin? There's only one other source, the government. Now, if we deny the existence of God in our political institutions, then we must accept the premise that government is the source of our rights. But if we accept that premise, then we must accept the corollary, that if government can grant rights, it also has the power to take them away. And I don't think many Americans would want to accept that if they thought it through. And so, the John Birch Society does not sidestep the issue of religion. We're not founding a new religion. We're not competing with any particular denomination. All we're doing is proclaiming the importance of religion as the indispensable foundation not only for national morality, but also for liberty. And then for ourselves, we have drawn a circle of faith that is broad enough for each member to step inside that circle without violating his own personal religious convictions. If I were asked to summarize the principles in which the members of the John Birch Society believe, I would explain it as a dual concept of individualism and morality. Individualism and morality. But we also have a slogan, which although slightly longer, says it all very well. Perhaps you've heard it. It is, less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world. The next time you hear that slogan, I sincerely hope that my efforts here will have enabled you to hold a better appreciation of the deep meaning behind those words. In the year 500 BC, a Chinese philosopher and general by the name of Sun Tzu declared, if a man knows himself and knows his opponent, he need not fear a hundred battles. If a man knows himself and knows not his opponent, for every victory he will suffer a defeat. If a man knows neither himself nor his opponent, he is a fool and will suffer defeat in every battle. Now, knowing ourselves and the principles in which we believe, as important as that is, it is not enough. We must also know our opponent if we are not to be fools and suffer defeat in every battle. 
So it's time now for us to climb down from our ivory tower of nebulous theory and turn to the next part of the definition of the John Birch Society that needs to be explained. What is the opposition against us? Now you'll notice I haven't even mentioned the word communism so far, except to relate it to the political spectrum. And it comes as a great surprise to those who are learning about the John Birch Society for the first time to discover that what we're for is more important to us than what we're against and that we're not primarily an anti-communist organization. To us, communism is merely the current manifestation of certain forces that have been around for a long time under different labels. Long after communism has been destroyed and relegated to the dusty pages of history, these same forces will continue to plague future generations as well, but under a new name. What are these forces? There are two. There are always two, and there are only two. The first we've already identified, collectivism, total government. And the second, amorality, merely a 25 cent word for the complete absence of true moral standards of any kind. These are the twin forces of despotism everywhere, past, present, or future. Peel off the label communism, or fascism, or Nazism or any other similar ism from history. And what do you find? Although the exterior form may be different, the essence is always the same, total government over the people and the abandonment of morality in public life, collectivism and a morality. Now we think it's important to understand this because otherwise, in our zeal to overcome communism, the American people could be maneuvered unwittingly into replacing communism with merely another form of the same thing. In the 20s, the unsuspecting people of Germany became alarmed over the inroads being made in their country by domestic communism. And then Adolf the paper hanger came along and said, follow me, I'll get rid of communism for you. So they followed him, and he did get rid of communism. But he put in its place exactly the same thing, only under a different flag. The good people of Germany never stopped to ask what Hitler offered behind his anti-communist slogans and promises of welfare. Most of them had never read Mein Kampf, and of those who did, very few really knew what they were reading. They were unable to recognize those opposing jaws that always constitute tyranny, collectivism, and amorality. And so, in their zeal to avoid tyranny, and through their ignorance of the nature of tyranny, they were manipulated into tyranny. And it was all done through the democratic process. Remember, Hitler was voted into power. Could this happen in America? You bet it could. The process has already begun. In the name of opposing communism, we are now plunging headlong into collectivism at a rate unparalleled in history. What meaning would a victory over communism have if, in the process, we embrace total government and abandon our morality? Yet the form of tyranny called communism is still very real. It can't be ignored. All questions of theory aside, the plain fact is that if we don't defeat communism, we just aren't going to be free, and many of us won't even be alive, to continue the ideological debate. And so, even though the defeat of communism is not our primary objective, of life and death necessity, it becomes our first order of business. If we are to know our opponent, therefore, we must now answer the question, what is communism? Now, actually, that's not nearly as hard a question to answer as you might think. The communists themselves give us the definition. They call it Marxism-Leninism which means simply that communism is a combination of the ideological teachings of Karl Marx and the organizational strategy and tactics laid down by Vladimir Ilyich Ulanov Lenin. Now all we have to do really is understand the ideology of Marx and the tactics of Lenin. And in spite of the thickness of their books, neither one is very hard to grasp. If you've read the Communist Manifesto or Das Kapital, then you know that Karl Marx taught only two things, socialism and atheism. Everything else was in support of these two concepts, 
socialism, and atheism. By the way, notice that these are merely different words for collectivism and amorality. And we're back to that again, the essential ingredients for any tyranny. But the words he preferred to use were socialism and atheism. So let's use those. While Marx laid down the ideological base of communism, Lenin created the Communist Party and added the physical organizational form. If you agree with Karl Marx that socialism and atheism are ideologically sound, then by definition you are a Marxist. But that doesn't make you a communist by a long shot. If in addition to being a Marxist, you also are willing to join the Communist Party founded by Lenin, are willing to subject yourself to the discipline of the party, and unhesitatingly follow the organizational tactics and strategy laid down by the party, then you are a Marxist-Leninist, and then you are a true communist. Therefore, if we are to know our opponent, we must know that communism is not just an ideology, for that would be only Marxism. It is both an ideology and an organization. Let me repeat that because it's the foundation for everything that follows. Communism is both an ideology and an organization. Let's turn now to the record. This book by Nikita Khrushchev entitled Socialism and Communism was printed in English and published in Moscow. Back here on page 158, Khrushchev said, The Communist Party, founded and tempered by the great Lenin, is a powerful force, comrades. Without the party, we would have been an unorganized mass of people. Now, note that line. Without the party, we would have been an unorganized mass of people. It's a very important concept, and we'll come back to it later. All of us communists are united by the great Marxist-Leninist ideas. The source of our party's strength and invincibility lies in its ideological and organizational cohesion. And so I repeat, communism is both an ideology and an organization. Joseph Kornfeder was one of the original charter members of the Communist Party in America. He joined in 1919. He received special training in Moscow and returned to this country dedicated to the cause of world communism. And then, like so many others, gradually he began to see through the intellectual deception of the communist promise. He broke away from the party and became an equally dedicated anti-communist. Now in 1955, Joseph Kornfeder gave a speech in San Francisco. And I'd like to read to you one paragraph taken directly from the transcript of that speech. Kornfeder said, the true characteristics of the Communist Party are to be found not so much in its theories as in its methods of organization. Keep in mind that they are applying a new concept of warfare, the concept of conquering a country from within. How do you conquer a country from within? You conquer it by capturing the organizations that operate inside the country, a labor union, a farm organization or newspaper guild, a teacher's association a political club, a government agency, etc., are considered as power centers. The sum total of these organizations is the sum total of power. The Communist Party organizes inside of these organizations group by group. To fight them effectively, one has to do the same thing in reverse. Mere resolution passing can't cope with that sort of an enemy." End quote. Of course, that's certainly true. Mere resolution passing, merely declaring loudly that we're against communism, cannot cope with that sort of an enemy. Now, Lenin, the founder of the Communist Party, explained it this way, and I quote, The party is the conscious advanced section of a class, its advance guard. The power of this advance guard is ten, a hundred times greater than its numbers. Is that possible? Can the power of a hundred exceed the power of thousands? It can exceed it when the hundreds are organized. Organization increases power by tenfold." End quote. 
And this, of course, is the reason why the communists have been winning around the world. Not because they're smarter or because they outnumber their opposition, but simply because they're organized. A handful has had the power and effect of thousands. You know, occasionally someone will say to me, aren't you rather silly, worried about communism in this country, when there are so few of them? What harm can such a small group do to a big, strong country like ours? And of course, such people have not done their homework. They have no idea of how communism actually works. Well, they've heard a little bit about the Marxist ideology of communism, but they know nothing about the Leninist organization of communism. They're unaware, for instance, that in the Soviet Union, even after all of these years, the actual number of people who are communists, members of the party, are less than 3% of the total population. In Red China, less than 2%. But more important than that, at the time of takeover, communists have come to power in one country after another with no more than one half of 1% of the population. And in some cases, much less than that. Massive numbers are not important in this phase of the battle. If you remember nothing else I say in this entire presentation, please remember that. Ideology is important. Numbers are not. Dedication is important. Numbers are not. Organization is extremely important. Numbers are not. Now, in addition to the advantage of organization, our communist opposition also has the flexibility of being able to resort to completely amoral tactics. Lenin taught that whatever helps to bring communism to power is moral. The only test is, does it work? The leaders of world communism are forever saying that they want peaceful coexistence. Let our two systems, let our two ideologies compete fair and square. They say, let the best ideology win. They always talk about their ideology, but you notice they never say anything about their organization. We're not supposed to even notice that they also have an organization with working units established in every country in the world. And while they're talking about open and fair competition between ideologies, their organization is getting ready to pull the rug right out from underneath us, if it can. Again, let's turn to the record. Benjamin Gitlow, the author of this book, was for many years one of the most important communists in the entire world. He was General Secretary of the Communist Party, USA a member of the Executive Committee of the Communist International in Moscow, and a full member of the Presidium, the very highest ruling group within the world communist movement. But like so many others, Gitlow broke away from the Communist Party and became an anti-communist. After doing so, he wrote this book, The Whole of Their Lives, telling of his own personal experiences. This is a vital document written by a man who speaks not from hearsay or from research, but from first-hand experience. Now, Gitlow describes a series of street meetings that were staged by the Communist Party on the Lower East Side of New York. After the crowd had gathered to applaud the party speakers, a fight broke out between the party members and their opposition. Now, the fight was expected. There had been others in the past, and this one had been planned for with great care. After the party goon squads had thoroughly beaten their opposition, then here is how Gitlow describes what happened. He says, and I quote, But what the mob below did not know was that on the roof of the tall tenement, a number of communists were hidden in the dark shadows of the building's cornice. Below, another communist standing aside from the crowd waited to give a fateful signal. The signal was given when the communists controlled the corner with their own people. Heavy cobblestones of granite came hurtling down in the darkness. One communist, Nick Kruzik, a simple ordinary worker, was taken to the hospital where he died of a fractured skull. Another, Michael Seaman, a hard-working Slav, died in the hospital the next morning. Now, Gitlow then describes how the murders were used to create martyrs for the communist cause and to whip up hatred against those of their opposition who presumably were the only ones with motive for such a crime. And then Gitlow says, such premeditated murders of communists by communists had taken place before and were considered justified by the political objectives of communist necessity. They will be repeated. The time, the place, and the circumstances will be different. The incentives, the same. 
Now, in October of 1965, a high-ranking official of the Hungarian Communist Party defected to the West. He held the rank of major in the AVH secret police. His name was Laszlo Zabo. And a few months later, he testified in hearings before the CIA subcommittee of the Congressional Committee on Armed Services. Now, during his testimony, Laszlo Zabo explained the operation of a special department within the secret police in charge of what they called disinformation. Now, really, it was the everyday job of this department of disinformation to manufacture and promote lies that could be useful worldwide against America. Now, in the center portion of these hearings, there's a photograph of two editions of Newsweek magazine. And they were released in uh, November and December of 1963. Now, as you can see, uh, the first carries a cover with a picture of Senator Barry Goldwater, and the second, a picture of President Kennedy. Now, the interesting thing about these issues is that they never appeared in the United States. They're complete phonies. They were printed on the secret presses of the Department of Disinformation in Hungary, and then widely disseminated in Europe, Africa, Asia, Latin America, as powerful weapons of anti-American propaganda. Superior ideology? Hardly. A perfect example of communist organization at work. After describing this incident in detail, Laszlo Zabo then said, Major Janos Fures, chief of special activities, the unit responsible for disinformation work in the Hungarian service, he told me they preferred that an item for disinformation should have some real basis in fact. But if I can produce a good idea that does not have any fact, send it in anyway. Truth is not important if the idea is good. Just send it in, they'll make it look truthful, then get it published in some little newspaper somewhere. And after that, we will hand it out, get it republished everywhere. Who can prove it is not true? End quote. Now this too, we must know about our opponent if we are not to be fools and suffer defeat in every battle. Some time ago, the Communist Party published this little booklet entitled, A Manual on Organization. It contains their detailed plans for disciplining members, collecting dues, operating secret printing presses, organizing cells in factories, colleges, and farming communities. It even describes the function of a fraction, a unit smaller than the cell itself. A fraction can be composed of two or more communists, within the same non-communist organization. Their task is to work together secretly for the purpose of gaining control of that organization, the very process described earlier by Joseph Kornfeder. Now, if you haven't read this, and of course, most non-communists have not, then it's almost impossible to appreciate the degree to which communism depends on organization rather than ideology. But getting back to the subject of tactics, there's a particularly revealing passage back here on page 122. They're discussing how to handle former comrades who break away from the party, and particularly those who have the audacity to testify before congressional investigating committees. And here's what they say. There is only one proper method of exposing the stool pigeons, and that is mass exposure, creating and organizing mass hatred against these rats. One, photograph the spy and print his picture in leaflets and stickers. Spread this material in the place where the spy was operating. Two, organize systematic agitation among the workers where the spy was discovered. Three, mobilize the children and women in the block in the part of town where the stool pigeon lives to make his life miserable. Let them pick at the store where his wife purchases groceries and other necessities. Let the children in the street shout after him or after any member of his family that they are spies, rats, stool pigeons. Four, chalk his home with the slogan, so-and-so who lives here is a spy, etc. In 1943, the following directive was issued from party headquarters to all communists in the United States. It read, when certain obstructionists become too irritating, Label them, after suitable build-ups, as fascist, or Nazi, or anti-Semitic, and use the prestige of anti-fascist and tolerance organizations to discredit them. In the public mind, 
constantly associate those who oppose us with those names which already have a bad smell. The association will, after enough repetition, become fact in the public mind. Now, in 1967, I had the privilege of attending the New England Rally for God, Family, and Country in Boston over the 4th of July. Now, this is an annual affair, and generally speaking, it's just an old-fashioned 4th of July rally extended over four days. It's pretty well known that most of the thousands who attend each year are members of the John Burt Society. There are plenty of exceptions, of course, but it's widely thought of in Boston as an unofficial Burt Society convention. On the second day of the rally, which was held at the Statler Hilton Hotel, we came down from breakfast and discovered that someone had placed copies of this flyer on the windshield of every automobile within several blocks of the hotel. And how many additional thousands may have been distributed elsewhere in town, we have no way of knowing. Now, it looks exactly like the flyers the rally had put out the previous day. It was on the same color of paper, used the same kind of type. And whoever printed this even went so far as to photographically reproduce the official emblem for the rally. Now, it reads, Fifth Annual New England Rally for God, Family, and Country. Reveals mystery speaker, Sunday, July 2nd, Grand Ballroom, evening, 7 o'clock. And then, in bold type, it says, George Lincoln Rockwell exposes yellow niggers and red Jews. Well, now, you can imagine the impact on the innocent people who picked this off of their windshields or off the doorknobs of their homes. And you can imagine what they thought about the New England rally for God, family, and country and the people who attended. By the way, I'm sure there's no doubt in anyone's mind here, but just for the record, I suppose I'd better say it. This flyer was not printed by the New England rally for God, family, and country. <laughs> Who put it out? Of course, we don't know. But whoever it was obviously considered themselves to be our opponents. And we must clearly understand what kind of tactics such opponents are willing to use. Now, in 1961, shortly after I'd become a staff coordinator for the Society in California, I received a letter of inquiry from a Mr. and Mrs. Forrest Rogers in San Diego. So the first chance I had, I loaded up the car with films and books and drove down to San Diego to see if I could form a chapter there. When I arrived, I called the Rogers on the phone. I introduced myself as the coordinator for the Society, told them I'd received their letter, and asked if they'd like to have me make a presentation in their home. They said, sure, come on over. So I did. But when I got there, I noticed a certain coldness and suspicion in their attitude. And of course, I was used to that sort of thing, and it didn't particularly bother me because I was well aware of what people had been reading about the society in their newspapers. Naturally, they'd be on their guard. At any rate, in spite of the obvious reserve on the part of the Rogers that evening, I pretended not to notice and went on my merry way explaining the society and answering questions as best I could. And finally, I suppose I convinced them that I was okay, that I wasn't going to whip out my swastika or whatever else they thought I was going to do. And then they finally told me what was on their minds. Mr. Rogers had written several patriotic letters to the editor of the local newspaper, the San Diego Union. Immediately, he began to receive in the mail a series of postcards, and he showed them to me. And they went something like this. Dear Mr. Rogers, congratulations on your excellent letter to the editor. You certainly are a well-informed and courageous American. However, you forgot to mention that the Kennedy administration is riddled not only with those Catholics, but also with niggers and Jews, too. Signed, no name, but merely member local chapter of the John Birch Society. P.S. Won't you please attend our meetings? Well, ladies and gentlemen, not only had there been no meetings of the Society in the San Diego area, we didn't yet have even one local chapter. Now, I have no idea how many similar postcards have been sent to other people and in other cities, but I do know there have been many. I have no way of knowing how many people have been awakened by a phone call in the middle of the night and heard a voice at the other end. This is the John Birch Society calling. Get out of town, you dirty commie. But I can tell you that there have been thousands of them. And I can also tell you 
that the impact on those who have received such postcards, letters, and telephone calls has been what you might call rather profound. Now, in 1966, Governor Scranton of Pennsylvania received a letter on official John Birch Society stationery carrying the signature of our local coordinator, threatening to kill the governor if the United States didn't resume the bombing of Hanoi. Now, as you can imagine, this rather upset the governor, and he turned the matter over to the FBI. After extensive investigation, enough evidence was gathered to cause a Philadelphia grand jury to hand down 27 counts of indictment against one Leonard Fairroth. It turns out that Fairroth had somehow stolen society stationery and had rather expertly forged the signature of our coordinator. He had not only threatened to kill Governor Scranton, but also had threatened the governor's wife, had written a letter threatening to kill President Johnson, and an obscene letter to Lucy Johnson. It also turns out that Leonard Fairroth is a fine, highly respected citizen in the community. As a long-time active member of the American Civil Liberties Union, naturally he'd been outspoken in favor of civil rights, free speech, peace, security, freedom, and all those other good things. It's especially interesting to note that on May 29th of that year, this same Leonard Fairworth had also written a letter to the editor, this time using his real name and his real signature. And the theme of his letter? You guessed it to condemn the John Birch Society for its bigotry and its underhanded tactics. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of opposition brought to bear against us. Not only us, but anyone else who opposes both the ideology and the organization of communism. If you ever intend to be a part of the contest, you too had better be prepared for exactly this kind of an onslaught. Now, before concluding this section, there's one more point that needs clarification. You'll notice that so far, I have refrained from using the expected phrase, communist conspiracy. But according to the dictionary, a conspiracy simply is a group of two or more people secretly working together using unlawful methods to achieve an evil purpose. Now, are there two or more people in the Communist Party? Obviously. Do they work secretly together, willing to use unlawful means? Yes. And is their goal of communizing America an evil objective? Most Americans would consider it so. If the organization of communism isn't a conspiracy, then definitions and dictionaries are a complete waste of time. So let's not be squeamish about words. Let's call a spade a spade. Or to be more exact, call communism precisely what it is, a worldwide criminal conspiracy. What is it going to take to overcome such a conspiracy? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a short break now. And when you return, I'll attempt to answer that question. Ladies and gentlemen, to pick up the thread of this presentation where we left off, I repeat the question, what is it going to take to stand against and then overcome a force which by definition is a conspiracy, worldwide in scope, consisting of over 40 million members, not counting the billions of people under their control, but 40 million disciplined members of the party, people who identify themselves as Marxist-Leninists. What is it going to take to overcome an organization with active branches literally in every country of the world? What is it going to take to overcome opposition, which is schooled in the use of completely amoral and ruthless tactics, willing to use any means at all to conquer our nation from within? In other words, what is it going to take to overcome the ideology and the organization called communism? The answer is, it's going to take a superior ideology and a superior organization. Now, we believe that the John Birch Society already has the first, and it's rapidly building the second. 
The ideology of individualism and morality is far superior to that of collectivism and amorality. But superior ideology is not enough. People have got to come together and work together to promote that ideology, to give it physical form, the body and muscle it needs to survive, to compete, and then to win. As you recall, Khrushchev said, without the party, comrades, we Marxists would have been an unorganized mass of people. Well, that's just as true for us as it is for them. Without organization, we Americanists have been truly an unorganized mass of people, all well-intentioned, some hard-working, but totally ineffective as a constructive opposition to communism. Without organization, we can only react. We can't take the initiative. When our enemies refer to us as reactionaries, in the past they've been correct. We've always allowed them to make the first move, and then we've reacted in an effort to merely stop them. They've always been able to pick the issue, the time and the place, the battleground that suits them best, while we've been content merely to defend what they attack. But as everyone knows, the purely defensive is doomed to ultimate defeat. Isn't it about time we began to take the initiative for a change? But taking the initiative requires leadership. It requires the formulation of a plan of action. It requires a full-time staff to take that plan, break it down into its component parts, and to distribute those parts over a wide geographical area. And finally, it requires membership. Large numbers of people acting in unison to pool their resources and put that plan into operation from one end of the country to the other, and eventually over all the world. Well, I think everyone recognizes the value of organization in accomplishing almost any task, so let's not belabor the point. But the next question is, what kind of organization? Will any kind do? The answer, of course, is a resounding no. Not any kind will do. There are two basic kinds of organizations. The first is characterized by the fact that it responds to the will of the majority. Robert's rules of order are followed, leaders are elected, and most issues are decided by the ballot. Such groups are called parliamentary organizations. Examples are myriad, the PTA, the Rotary, Kiwanis, and in theory at least, our own government. The other type of organization is characterized by the fact that the will of the majority is not decisive in determining its course of action. Decisions are made at the various levels of leadership. These are called monolithic organizations, and examples are an army, a football team, a business, or a religious body. Can you imagine a football team huddled out there in the middle of the field with the quarterback taking a vote for the next play, or a business conducting a poll among its employees to determine what hours to work and what wages to pay, what to produce and what price to sell? Or can you imagine any religious body determining its articles of faith through the process of majority rule? Of course not, because all of these groups are and should be monolithic. They couldn't perform their function if they weren't. Now, one of the most often heard criticisms of the John Birch Society is that it is monolithic, and the word is usually spoken in heavy tones, as if to say, color it sinister. And yet, we have no objection to anyone using that word to describe us, provided, of course, they really understand what it means. Now, according to the dictionary, a monolith is a solid body, like a rock, without splinter or division, and that's us. Before going any further, it's important to notice the difference between the monolithic form in government and outside of government. Now, in government, because of its coercive nature, the monolith is exactly what we oppose. When government speaks, it has the force to compel everyone to obey, whether they want to or not. Now, this is the essence of collectivism. But outside of government, in strictly voluntary organizations, anyone can resign at any time. If we don't like the coach or the quarterback on our team, we get off the team and find something else to do with our time. If we disagree with the religious doctrine taught by our church, we simply change churches. If we disagree with the principles of the John Burt Society, we don't join it in the first place. And if after we have joined it, we feel that a particular project is wrong or in poor taste, 
then we're simply not expected to participate in that project. We concentrate on the ones with which we do agree. And obviously, if there should develop very many points of disagreement, we would drop out. Outside of the self-discipline of our own conscience, there's no means in the world to keep us in or to make us work. Just because we take advantage of group action does not mean we've adopted collectivism. Being an individualist doesn't mean I have to move my piano alone. The difference between collectivism and cooperation simply is that under collectivism, group action is mandatory. Under cooperation, it's voluntary. And that's precisely the difference between the monolithic form of organization in government and in the John Birch Society. All competitive groups must be monolithic if they're to compete. And please note, all groups which have as their purpose the promotion of an ideology should be monolithic because if they're not, then they will lose their ideology. Now to illustrate this point, all we have to do is take a look at the political parties. Political parties are usually formed in the very beginning when a group of people who share the same political ideologies decide to get organized in order to be more effective in promoting their common goals. But instead of adopting the monolithic form, traditionally they accept the parliamentary form. And the result? They lose their ideology. I doubt if one person out of a hundred today even remembers what the ideologies were that led to the creation of our major parties. At any rate, whatever they were, they're certainly not the same today. And whatever they are today, chances are they won't be the same tomorrow. They're subject to democratic change, and consequently they do change every four years. Party platforms are no longer statements of genuine political ideology, but a compromised and amended mishmash of glittering phrases without meaning. And what little meaning may appear to be there is certainly no obstacle to the politicians who supposedly endorse the platform. Once they're elected, they do exactly what they please anyway. Political platforms are a farce. Now, the John Birch Society wants no part of this nonsense. The people who join our organization a hundred years from now will be endorsing exactly the same principles for which we strive today. We think those principles are important and we're determined to preserve them. Now, this is not to condemn political parties. It's merely to understand them, which we must do if we're to be effective working within them. And although I'll come back to this subject shortly, I've mentioned it here merely to illustrate the point that unless an ideological group adopts the monolithic form of organization, it will lose its ideology. Perhaps the most practical reason for the John Birch Society being monolithic is the fact that if it had not been, it easily could have been infiltrated by communist agents. Posing as sincere, hard-working anti-communists, they could have either taken over completely or at least bogged us down in endless debates, arguments, committee actions, splinter movements, and parliamentary quicksand. Our enemies are experts at tying anti-communist organizations into knots. But the agent provocateur has pretty slim pickings in the John Birch Society. If a communist agent unknown to us came into our ranks for the purpose of discovering our secrets, he'd be truly disappointed. We don't have any. If he wanted to bottle things up in committee, he'd be the only member of the committee. Everyone else would continue working as planned. If he tried to promote a racism or anti-Semitic attitude or violence or anything else contrary to our principles, we would merely refund the unused portion of his dues and bid him farewell. So what does our infiltrator do? While he's a member, he's expected to work. We're not operating a luncheon function. If he stays in and wants to work for our cause, well, fine. We need all the help we can get. But, of course, he would not stay in under those conditions. And that is the most effective safeguard, the only safeguard against infiltration by the enemy. The voluntary monolithic form of organization adopted by the John Birch Society is not only commonplace in our daily lives, not only compatible with the concept of freedom, but it is absolutely essential in our fight against communism. Now, returning to the question of politics for a moment, the structure of the John Birch Society is one of the reasons why 
It is not and never can be a political group, at least not as the word political generally is understood. It is not partisan. It does not identify with any party, but it is concerned over political action and political results. The most effective political action being carried out today, action which brings about tangible results in our legislatures and courts, does not come from the political parties. It comes from the nonpartisan groups, which generally are thought of as being nonpolitical. Americans for Democratic Action, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the American Civil Liberties Union, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Committee on Political Education, to name just a few. As a matter of fact, the Committee on Political Education, COPE, is perhaps the most effective political organization in the entire country today. I don't know if you're familiar with how COPE operates, but it's no secret that they throw millions of dollars into political activity carefully designed to favor collectivist candidates, regardless of party. They register voters, they endorse candidates, hand out campaign literature, put up billboards, run newspaper ads, put political messages on radio and TV, make films, provide speakers, and maintain a powerful lobby in Washington. Now, here is a brochure they put out just prior to the 1966 elections. It's entitled, They're Playing for Keeps, and it's all about us, the dangerous birchers. I'd like to read just a part of this to you because I think it'll give you a better idea of the nonpartisan nature of politics today. Remember, this was written by experts at the game. On page two, it reads, Out of their crushing 1964 defeat, the extremists, John Birchers and others, learned a valuable lesson. They learned that sound and fury from a national platform are no substitute for planning and organization at the ward and precinct level. They've been planning and organizing ever since. Well, they're not quite right on that. Actually, uh, we've been planning and organizing long before they ever figured it out, but basically they're correct. And then it says, the John Birch Society expects to recruit 1,000 members in each of 325 congressional districts. The threat can't be laughed off. The Birch Society has a record of making good on its goals and its membership has increased dramatically to a present strength of 80,000 to 100,000. It grows every month. The John Birch Society now has a staff of 250 paid employees. It has five regional public relations offices. It has headquarters on the east and west coasts. It has a network of 360 bookstores selling to the public. It pours out a river of printed material never before matched in quantity by a splinter political movement. It has a National Speakers Bureau, which arranges more than 50 public lectures a month in major communities throughout the nation. It is set up, staffed, and financed for full-scale political action. Well, understanding that they view political action as nonpartisan in nature, then they're entirely correct. We are set up, staffed, and financed for full-scale political action. It's our task not only to help influence public opinion through educational activity, but also to mobilize the expression of that public opinion in such a way as to force politicians to institute the desired changes in government policies. Now, political parties, by their very nature, cannot perform this function. They really operate for only a few months every two years. At election time, the machine is turned on, and for a few weeks, a tremendous amount of money and effort is expended to elect candidates. Then the machine is turned off and everybody takes a two-year vacation. By the way, that's one of the reasons why partisan politics is so attractive to many people. It doesn't really demand that much. Anybody can handle a few weeks every two years. But the real political action, the measures that preset the dials on that machine, that determine the direction it'll run when it is turned on. This work is done between elections, every year, every month, and every single day. And this is why we say in the John Birch Society that education is the means, partisan politics is merely the mechanism. 
Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. I'm not suggesting that anyone abandon politics. As a matter of fact, we urge all of our members to become active in the political party of their choice. I'm merely saying that we should clearly understand the weaknesses of politics as well as its advantages, that we need both kinds of political action and that we must place principle above party. On several occasions so far, I've alluded to the fact that we can learn much from studying the tactics of our enemies. And this leads many to wonder if it's true what they've heard about the John Birch Society using communist tactics. Well, believe it or not, it is true. <laughs> now, before you go jumping to conclusions, let me explain. Not everything the communists do is wrong, obviously. Just because they've utilized certain tactics doesn't mean that we shouldn't do so. For example, the communists organize into small working units to facilitate getting things done, and so do we. The communists circulate petitions to Congress, so do we. The communists set up front groups to mobilize mass action. They have the Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born, the SANE Nuclear Policy Committee, the Emergency Civil Liberties Committee, and hundreds more. We have our Support Your Local Police Committee, the Truth About Civil Turmoil Committee, the Committee to Restore American Independence Now, the Movement to Restore Decency, and hopefully hundreds more in the future. What's wrong with such groups? We call them ad hoc committees rather than fronts, but regardless of what you call them, our committees perform a tremendous service to the people in them, members and non-members alike. They provide an effective vehicle for promoting a relatively narrow and specific objective. They make it possible for people who disagree with each other on many other things to come together and work together for those principles which they do hold in common. And it makes no sense to abandon this tactical concept for the enemy's exclusive use. You'll notice, however, that the communists try to conceal their authorship of these groups. We go out of our way to make it known. And here is precisely where we part company, because with the communists, they are willing to use deceit, whereas truth is our only weapon. Now, this doesn't give them the advantage either. They must use deceit. They have no choice. You can imagine how far they'd get if they all came right out in the open, admitted that they were communists, and then called for a dictatorship of the proletariat, explaining furthermore that we play that game with them being the dictators and us the proletariat. Of course, they wouldn't get to first base, and they know it. So they have to cover up instead with talk about love, peace, and freedom. But because they are lying, it's possible to expose them, and this is their Achilles heel. Now, by comparison, we have nothing to hide, therefore we have no reason to lie, and we wouldn't want to even if we could. Truth is a far superior weapon than deceit. It's a weapon which is denied to them. And in the end, it will be the decisive weapon that destroys them completely. Now, the question of organization and of tactics leads to the question of leadership, and in particular, the leadership of the founder of the John Birch Society, Robert Welch. Someday, an appropriate and objective biography of this man will be written. When it is, I think you'll be extremely impressed, not only by his accomplishments, but also by the way in which the opinion molders of our day have distorted his public image beyond any recognition of the real man. Unfortunately, this is neither the time nor the place for such a study. But let the record be clear on one thing. As far as the members of the John Birch Society are concerned, our respect and esteem for Robert Welch is so high, it comes close to reverence itself. It's been my experience that those who are most critical of what Mr. Welch has said about President Eisenhower, and this is the main objection that usually comes up, they're the ones, frankly, who have no knowledge of what he did say about Eisenhower. And I'm not being facetious either. Oh, I know, they think that they know. Uh, they've read all about it from our critics. They've seen the quotation marks placed around all kinds of statements, some of them accurate, most of them inaccurate, and all of them taken out of context. But most of these people have never read the book called The Politician, in which these statements were made and explained. 
I have met very few who were upset with what Robert Welch said in The Politician after they had read it. So what more can I say? If you have not read The Politician, then get a copy and read it. I think you owe it to yourself. Your very presence here indicates an interest in learning about the society. And frankly, it's impossible to have any understanding of the society without becoming familiar with the writings and teachings of its founder. So read the life of John Birch. Read May God Forgive Us and The New Americanism. But above all, read The Blue Book and The Politician. And then make up your own mind. I think you'll be impressed by what you find. You'll be impressed not only by the magnitude of the man's intellect and the extent of his knowledge, but also by his record of calling the shots. Time and time again, he has alerted the American people to an unpleasant fact that was important for us to know. Time and time again, he was ridiculed and condemned for doing so by the respectable experts who assured us that he was wrong. And time and time again, tragic events have unfolded to prove that Robert Welch was right after all. Before dropping the topic, however, let me add one more suggestion. You form your own anti-communist organization sometime. You mobilize 100,000 people nationwide. You begin to push against the ideology and the organization called communism. And then just see what your public image will look like. And I think you can well imagine what it would be. In September of 1966, I had the privilege of attending the meeting of the Council of the John Birch Society. And during that meeting, Mr. Welch delivered a short address to the council members and guests present. I was deeply moved by his remarks, particularly one part of the speech. And afterward, I requested permission to quote that part if ever I had occasion to do so. Mr. Welch consented, but I've never had a reason before now to repeat what was said that day. And it's quite likely that this is the first time that these words have been made public. Mr. Welch began by describing the predicament of the lady driver who was waiting at a stoplight one day at a busy intersection. When the light turned green, she tromped on the gas, jerked forward about 20 feet, and stalled the engine right smack in the middle of everything. She tried to start the car again, but all she was doing was flooding the carburetor and running down the battery. Traffic began to back up in all directions. People were honking their horns, and there she sat. And finally, a policeman came over to the car. He scowled at her through the window, and he said, Lady, would you please get that car out of here? Well, at this point, the woman jumped out of the car, completely frustrated. She said, Officer, my driver's license is expired. This isn't my car. It's borrowed. I can't get it started. I think it's out of gas, and I wash my hands of the whole matter. And with that, she slammed the door behind her and walked away. <laughs> now, after having described this little scene, here is what Robert Welch then said. Sometimes the misunderstandings and frustrations almost tempt me to wish I could act that way about the John Burt Society. I have books I should like to write, places I would like to go, and games I should like to play in whatever years there might remain for me. But gentlemen, as far as I personally am concerned, it can't be done. I could see far enough ahead about the enemy we faced and the nature of the struggle to realize full well the extreme unlikelihood of my ever having any real peace or leisure, free time of my own again. And as Rupert Brooke said about his rendezvous with death, this is my rendezvous with life to which I shall be true. The reason why I could not make myself and some other people happy by just turning over this whole job to somebody else is that I have promises to keep. And those promises have been made at least by binding implication to tens of thousands of people who in reliance on them have suffered and labored and sacrificed and prayed in many cases with the spirit and fortitude of martyrs. I cannot let these tens of thousands of people down and I have no intention of doing so. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter what the future leadership of the John Birch Society may be, those of us who are members of it today will always be grateful to Robert Welch 
for remaining true to his rendezvous with life, as he calls it, and for keeping his promises to us. If leadership is the backbone of an organization, then membership is its muscle. What about our membership? Just how effective has it been? You know, quite often we hear people say, I can be more effective on the outside. I can do more good if I don't become controversial. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the only way to avoid controversy in these matters is to stay out of the contest. It reminds me of the football player that liked the game but was afraid of getting his uniform dirty. The more effective we are against our enemies, the more they attempt to discredit us and the more controversial we become. The fact that the John Birch Society is controversial is not a result of our mistakes, but of our successes. You want to be effective against communism? Then you'd better be prepared to become controversial. If you're not controversial, then you're not hurting the enemy. Of course, most of those who think they can be more effective on the outside are just kidding themselves. There are exceptions, naturally. But because they're denied the many advantages of organization and team effort, instead of being more effective, or even as effective, most of them end up doing practically nothing at all. But still, it's a legitimate question. Could we have been more effective on the outside, those of us who are now members? What if everyone had taken that course? What then? Well, obviously, there would be no John Burt Society. Without members, there'd be no organization. There would have been tens of thousands of meetings never held, hundreds of speakers never heard, millions of books never printed and hence never read. There would have been scores of films never produced, bookstores never opened, radio programs never broadcast, study groups never formed, billboards never erected, petitions never circulated, handbills never printed, committees never started, and literally millions of people never informed. In fact, without the John Birch Society, I wonder how few people in the entire country today would really understand what's going on. I don't know about you, but you're looking at one person who would not. I came out of the university spouting all of the proper collectivist cliches, and I'd been conditioned like everyone else to smirk with an air of amused superiority whenever anyone expressed a concern over domestic communism. It wasn't until I ran smack into the John Birch Society that I was exposed to the other side and began to reevaluate my premises. It's my conviction that there simply would be no substantial anti-communist movement in America today if our members had been more effective on the outside. But just how effective have we been on the inside? How can you measure that? Well, let's let our enemies answer that question. This booklet, entitled The American Ultras, was published by the American Socialist Party. Now, as you can tell by the cover, it's all about us. And here's what it says back here on page 65. What makes the ultras such a challenge is that they are not simply the product of conditions and forces, but rather they are building a movement which is precisely the point. We are unlike anything they've ever faced before. Always in the past, they've been able to take the initiative with nothing but sporadic reaction from our side. Now, for the first time in history, they're facing a movement with goals of its own. They're having to defend for a change, and they don't like it one bit. The Communist Party, USA, publishes a small newspaper in San Francisco entitled the People's World. In this issue, dated March 18th, 1967, they ran a feature article entitled A Close Look at the Birchers. And here is their appraisal. The John Birch Society is the largest and most sophisticated anti-communist organization in the United States. The right is a seething mass of over 4,000 organizations, bewildering in their titles, aims, and diversity. Of all these groups, only some 30 distinct organizations appear to be of national importance. And the prime one is the John Birch Society, end quote. Well, of course, we think it's a major accomplishment just to be in existence 
after the attacks that have been mounted against us these many years. And I think if you'd been standing at this end of the cannon, you'd feel rather proud of that too. Back in 1961, when they lowered the big guns on the John Birch Society for the first time, they fully expected there'd be nothing left but a hole in the ground where we'd been standing. Nobody had ever withstood that kind of an attack before. But when the smoke cleared, lo and behold, we were still there. Rather ragged looking around the edges to be sure, but we were still there. So they fired another salvo, and again we stood our ground. But this time, we visibly had grown. They fired again, and we grew. Again they fired, and still we grew. So finally they said, wait a minute, we're giving these people too much publicity. They thrive on our attacks. And then they ignored us for a long time. And we continued to grow. So they attacked us again, and we grew. No matter what they do, we grow. Because frankly, ours is an idea whose hour has come. And there's nothing they can do to stop us. In the face of everything our enemies have been able to throw against us, the John Birch Society has grown and prospered to the point where today it's the largest publisher of conservative and anti-communist books in the world. It operates the largest and most active speakers bureau in the world. It constitutes the largest chain of exhibitors of Americanist films and film strips in the world. In short, it's the largest and unquestionably the most effective anti-communist organization in existence in the entire world. And in view of the opposition thrown against us, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll forgive our pride in this accomplishment. Of course, it's not what we have done in the past that's so important. After all, we're a long way from winning this battle. While it's true, we have grown and prospered. So has the organization of communism. And they're moving rapidly toward their ultimate goal. So we can't afford to sit back and bask in the glories of our past accomplishments. It's our potential for the future that really counts. It's our potential for the future that not only gives us the most encouragement, but also frightens our enemies the most. For we now know, and so do they, that all we have to do is exactly what we have been doing, only with increased effort, and we shall succeed. Why then do people join the John Birch Society? They do so for only one reason, because they can be more effective on the inside, more effective promoting the principles in which they believe in accordance with a plan of action designed to overcome the opposition against them. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not discouraged that our numbers are small. The John Birch Society was never intended to be a mass movement. History has always been determined not by the many, but by the dedicated few who provided leadership, by the few who knew what they wanted, knew how to obtain it, and who were willing to make the necessary risks and sacrifices. This is just as true in American history as it is in world history. When Paul Revere went racing down those cobblestone streets shouting, the British are coming, you know, most of those who heard his voice went right back to sleep. Only a few answered the call. Only a few stood at the bridge. Only a few at Lexington and Concord. Only a few signed the Declaration. Only a few crossed the Delaware. Only a few contributed the political and religious theories that were hammered into our Constitution. And ladies and gentlemen, only a very few are going to save this Constitutional Republic if it is to be saved at all. As I mentioned earlier, numbers are not nearly as important as dedication. If just a handful of Americans would give to the preservation of their own liberties the same dedication as their enemies devote to the destruction of those liberties, there'd be no contest. We'd win hands down. Do you have any idea what the average communist gives to his cause? As a very minimum, Every communist must devote at least 10%, not only of his income, but more important, 10% of his time to the Communist Party. Now, that doesn't sound like very much until you start to figure it out. 
10% of an average person's waking time is 11 hours per week. And don't forget, that's a minimum figure. Many of them devote more than that. But they all give at least 11 hours every week to the cause of communism. Now the question is this. How many hours did you give last week for the principles in which you believe? How many hours did you spend last month? Of course, the truth of the matter is, most Americans don't devote 11 hours to their country all year long. The communists are counting on taking this nation, as they have all others, with less than one half of one percent of the population. But the point is, it can work both ways. One half of one percent of the population, organized and dedicated, is also more than enough to restore this nation to health and sanity once again. The question is not, can it be done, but is even a minority of Americans willing to do it? In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to make an appeal, if I could, to your emotions. Now, so far, this has not been what you'd call a motivational talk. I've dealt with political philosophy, theories of economics, organizational forms, and tactics. It's pretty hard to get excited over any of this unless we see it as part of a solution to a problem, a problem in which we are personally and emotionally involved. There's nothing wrong with this reaction, though, if it's based on facts. And so I appeal not only to your emotion, but also to your reason when I ask you these questions. How many more American men have to lose their lives in no-win wars before you join with us? Does it have to be your own son or your own husband? How many more riots and burning of cities must there be before you join with us? Must it be your own town, your own business, or your own home destroyed? How many more campuses must be turned into communist indoctrination centers? How many more churches converted into leftist political clubs? How many more government controls and regulations will it take? How much more welfare to discourage production and encourage idleness? How much more drugs and pornography? How much more crime? How many more taxes? How much more inflation? Look around you, my friends. Your world is crumbling. What more is it going to take? Now, if you have a better plan, then follow it. If you really are one of those rare individuals who can be more effective on your own without the advantages of organization, then prove it. Let's see your results. If you think you can form a better organization than ours, that you have the talent to build a nationwide leadership force and the time to train that force, and if you think you have the ability to attract over 100,000 members dedicated to your cause, and if you know for sure that you'll be able to withstand the attacks that will be leveled against you, then do it. Don't just talk about it, do it. I hope you'll forgive my exasperation with people who criticize us for making this mistake here and that mistake there while they themselves do nothing. The John Burt Society may not be perfect. Indeed, we make mistakes and we are painfully aware of them all. But until the perfect man creates the perfect organization with none but perfect members in it, the John Birch Society is our only choice. It's not merely an idea on the drawing boards. It's not something we're going to do someday in the future if we ever find the time or have the money. It's here now. It's proven its ability over many years. And all it needs to fulfill its destiny is you. With your prayers and with your help, together, we shall bring about less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world.